is open for development. You have to suspend air rights for you know the people behind. The, that's typically what we call NIMBYism. Yeah. Not um, exactly. You know, and 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 realize that if we're going to bring in 350,000 people per year, we have to. We as a society have an obligation to give these people a chance to live somewhere. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. I'm Dema Tamawala, this is Sim Minocha, and we're joined by Greg Mo Roma. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, thank Thanks you. Um, so, before we jump into everything, for the 5% of people who haven't heard of Centurion REIT, mm -hmm. uh, Centurion Apartment REIT, mm -hmm. can you give us the 30 second synopsis of your, your kind of history? Sure, so Centurion Asset Management is a uh, alternative investment manager primarily focused in real estate. Uh, we have uh, businesses in apartment buildings, student housing, so we're one of the largest student housing providers in the country. Uh, we provide alternative financing, so bridge, bridge financing for, for real estate borrowers, also corporate borrowers, and we do equity investing, investing in uh, new, new construction multifamily projects. Yeah, wow. Um, looking back on, sorry, looking back on uh, older videos, it's crazy to think how you guys like I was watching videos, I think from 2011, when you guys had 100 million under yeah. management, and now you have 1.4 billion. Yeah, uh, almost so 2 billion today, actually. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. wow, so growing very quickly. Um, so just taking a step back, can you tell us a little bit, because you were on the investment banking side yeah. mm -hmm. uh, after you graduated. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and how sure. that, uh, yeah, just the whole experience? Um, certainly, I was, I was on the trading side uh, second and third generation type derivatives, so it was very quantitatively oriented. So, uh, you know, a lot of my career has been very much focused on uh, analytics and, and quantitative uh, type approach to investing. So when I moved from that business to this business, I think I brought just a different mindset to, to, to the real estate space where I just kind of looked at things a little bit differently because I was really not wasn't really an, a real estate uh, insider to, this, to the extent that I grew up in the industry. Right. I came mm -hmm. at it from right. a completely different way. Right. And, uh, sorry, Sam, did you? No, I was just going to ask. So, so I think you just mentioned there that yeah. uh, obviously Centurion has a few different avenues. Yeah. So there's the debt team, there's yeah. the REIT. Mm -hmm. How many sort of funds are there involved in all those different aspects? So we have three different funds. So there's Centurion Apartment REIT, which is our flagship fund and the yeah. longest track record. So that ha has primarily two businesses in it. One is uh, the apartment business and the other is the student housing business. Then we have our Centurion Real Estate Opportunities Trust, which is our mortgage lending and equity development program. And then we have our Centurion Financial Trust, which is our fund that focuses on private debt, does mm -hmm. both real estate debt and um, corporate debt. Got it. Got it. So, what major transition then from yeah derivatives trading, where you're really analy yeah. analytically focused to apartments and lending and and that whole sphere? And, and not just derivatives trading, right? You were over in yeah. Singapore. And That's yeah. right. And, uh, like all over the world, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, and then why come back to Toronto or Ontario rather and start building up your portfolio? Sure. There? So let me address those in two different uh, for in a few different pieces. So, first off. Um, you know, why, why did I get in real estate? So one of the things is when I was in my old career, um, I was pretty much able to trade anything I wanted in the world. If I wanted to trade equities, if I wanted to trade gold or oil, right. I could. Right. So that basically meant that because of conflict of interest uh, reasons in an investment bank, there's almost nothing I can do for myself unless I decide <laughs> to buy yeah, a, you know, a mutual fund or I was going to buy, uh, you know, term deposits, and that just right. wouldn't stand for somebody who made their living making money for, on investing. So the only thing I could really do uh, that didn't pose a conflict of interest was real estate. So pretty much most of the money that I I made during my investment banking career, my trading career, I took and invested in real estate. So that's that's how I got the real estate start. Uh, I, I eventually got to the point where I was enjoying what I was doing more on my side job, my weekend job, yeah. than what I was doing for my day job. Right. And that's why I decided at one point to, to make a transition. Oh, so why did I come back to Canada? Well, Canada was, 
you know, when I decided to make the transition back or into, into real estate, what I did was I looked all over the world and did a, a, a comparison. So I looked at going to like Australia, I looked at going to, to Europe, like Germany or, or, or London, I had lived in London, yeah. you know, the United States, all over the place. And interestingly enough, the highest net return, so you know, the leveraged return you could get on the amount of money you had to put down, the cap rates you could get, and the financing costs, well, it was just so dead obvious. I remember my first couple of deals yeah. I looked at were like 20 plus percent cash on cash returns prior to, and this is buying apartments, right? Yeah. Prior to wow. any consideration for what you could do with value add or, mm -hmm. or even rents going up. So I thought, this is kind of an anomaly. This didn't make sense. And, yeah. and even in Canada, the best place for that was Ontario. And lo and behold, I, I was from Toronto. So it was kind of like serendipity. Everything kind of lined up. So I came back home. Wow. Um, can you, t so uh, like, how does one go about starting a REIT? Like, mm -hmm. What steps did you take? Did you go, um, you know, and back to Citibank and say, hey, uh, look, I have this idea. Yeah. Can you yeah. guys finance it? Like, how did you go about doing that? Oh, so that was, that was a long process of, of figuring it out. Um, you know, I, I, when I started the, the fund in 2003, we, we didn't start our, our REIT until 2009. Mm -hmm. And we'd start, our, I guess, our first fund in 2006. All prior to that, I was just doing it with my own capital. Right. Uh, but what I realized is one of the things I loved most and why I was in trading is because I'm a deal junkie. I like doing yeah. deals, right? I like that. So, As are we. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you get to a point where eventually you invest most of your own capital and then it's like, okay, now what? Now do I have to become a property manager? And that's not that much fun. Right. So, you know, it was how do I continue to grow? That's why I started a fund. And then, you know, the financial crisis happened and that kind of, like everything lined up, which was, you know, what the, the Halloween announcement of a prior, couple years prior had eliminated the income trusts. Mm -hmm. And so real estate investment trusts were all that was left. Mm -hmm. And the stock markets had got cut in half and you know interest rates went basically down to zero. So it was, it was almost near perfect timing to, to launch, right? People were scared, uh, apartment values were, were just fine. In fact, they went up a little, mm -hmm. right? And then, then you take on top of that, well, it's still tax, tax efficient. And you know, it just had all the right combination of things. So I just, I guess it was at one point I was like, well, what? Ha and I'm always looking for what do I do next to, you know, drive my business forward. And yeah. it was like, okay, I think there's a real market demand for this, and that's that's what we did. We launched the REIT. We took our existing portfolio, pulled it into the new organization, and just started on the long path of of building it up from there. And as a private REIT uh, coming out in that time. I mean, uh, that, at that time during the financial yeah. crisis, uh, you'd see a lot of cases where REITs would be trading at, trading at a discount yeah. to NAV, yeah. correct? So was that why you decided to keep it as a private REIT? And, and probably just because you didn't have the scale at that time, or what was the reason to keep it as a private REIT? Uh, the reasons to keep it private then are pretty much the same reasons today. Um, if you look at the correlations between what REIT prices did um, to the stock market, well, REIT prices went down even though the underlying mm -hmm. real estate didn't necessarily That's suffer. So, you know, I think investors, what investors are really looking for is capital preservation, right? The ability to sleep. So I just put yeah. those in the same bucket. Sorry. Some reasonable cash flow and uh, some, pos you know, some growth potentially over time. So if I had taken it public, I, I don't think we would be where we are today because we probably would have senior units go down dramatically in the financial crisis, right. uh, then we wouldn't have been able to raise capital to grow. Mm. Our administrative costs from being public would have been so high, would have crushed our profitability. And then, you know, we would have just been a subject to a takeover and that, that would have been probably the end of it. Um, I think the vast majority of my investors, the f one of the first questions I get asked is, are you going to take it public? Right. And the reason is, it's not because they want me to, because they see there's some big upside to do so, but they just don't want the volatility in their portfolio. So they really see it as uh, a core holding that just gives them the income, the capital preservations, a little bit of tax savings, some nice mm -hmm. growth, um, without that volatility that we see in the market. Yeah. yeah, no, I just wanted to talk about sort of how your investing approach 
yeah. started, you said yeah. you were able to look at 20% cash yeah. on yeah. cash yeah. without yeah. even yeah. doing any value add. Yeah. Well, obviously in today's market, if you're getting exist. four or five percent cash on cash, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Uh, and in especially departments, right? Yeah. And with cap rates that they are, yeah. like Toronto, sub four yeah. percent a lot of the time. Yeah. So how has your investment strategy had to change in correspondence with the yeah. market fundamentals changing yeah. around us? That's a really good question. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think has has always characterized us is we've had to find ways to do something a little bit differently, right? When we were small, we didn't have access to the large institutional capital. So, you know, I wasn't buying trophy buildings, not that I wanted to, because I couldn't make the numbers work. People were buying it for, uh, you know, to have something on the brochure and at a great corner and it right. looked great and all, all those criteria. And it just, just wasn't us. Um, so we had to find ways of either buying properties or um, focusing on areas that made sense to us where we thought less, fewer people were concentrated. And that really is kind of what has defined my career, moving, moving around different uh, pockets of the capital markets where I thought there were holes. Mm -hmm. So when I came, came and started this business, first it was secondary markets and it was mid-sized buildings. So secondary markets, why? Because we, we found that most people were focused on investing in their backyard. And when we talk about secondary markets, yeah. we're talking about Hamilton or yeah, Miami like Hamilton, or Kitchener, Waterloo, yeah, London. Uh, you know, those are what we call secondary markets, right. right? So we we segment our book into three buckets. We have primaries, which like Toronto, and then we do secondaries, which we call you know Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo, London, those kind of things, and then yeah. tertiaries. So tertiaries would be like Barrie, Huntsville, Gravenhurst, and those kind of things. Right. So we, we, we saw, okay, th first there's, there's this opportunity in uh, secondary markets because there's not a lot of capital focus there. Mm -hmm. And then we also thought, well, you know, the small buildings are inefficiently priced because you get a dentist who can buy it and he's mm -hmm. not really looking right. at a cap rate. He probably doesn't know what one is. So that means you can kind of get really silly pricing. Uh, and on the high end, you, know, you get the pension funds with really, really deep pockets and really, really long horizons who could afford to pay prices I couldn't. So we just thought that, you know, combining these two strategies, mid-sized buildings with, um, you know, secondary markets made sense. Right. And more people started to focus on it. So, you know, spread started going out. It's like, okay, what do we do next? Uh, that's when we kind of got into the student housing market because mm -hmm. we found a, a very similar thing. There was new product that was getting built because it was an emerging industry. Canada was still 10 to 15 years behind the United States. Yeah. but. Interestingly enough, some assets had started to get built, which were pretty good, uh, and the people who were building them were not institutions, they were small little guys, and for them to continue to build, which was the, where the real profits were, uh, they needed to cycle. So we thought, okay, we're rolling up this space would make a, a decent adjunct to our strategy, just an add-on, mm -hmm. and wouldn't attract the, you know, it wouldn't attract the interest of the really big funds because it wasn't a business that you could really, really scale to be worthwhile for a you know, $100 billion pension fund to go after. Right. So we just thought, hey, here's another perfect niche. And you know, then more people started to move into that business. So we had to find, well, you know, how do we get, how do we continue to scale this business? And that's where our, our lending and our equity investment program came from. It's like, right. okay, let's get into how do we provide ourselves with a pipeline? So it's like, let's form relationships with the developers who can feed us a pipeline. So we've always had to f try and figure out ways that we could use, you know, a little bit of ingenuity mm -hmm. uh, to try and build build a pipeline of opportunity for us, not having to compete in the market as much. Yeah, I, I think I read recently that you have even started investing in small to medium-sized businesses and enterprises. Uh, can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, we have a corporate lending business, so yeah. It was kind of a, a natural outcrop out of our, our real estate debt business, yeah. and so we don't we're not doing equity in those businesses. Sometimes we'll take warrants or you know we'll do convertible debentures or those kind of things. Right. But we're you know going back to the kind of investors that I have. They're very focused on capital preservation. They're you know they like some capital growth, but that's not the priority. Right. Um, so it was really the the corporate debt business that you know I thought was a natural growth. Uh, for us, and and I think 
it really kind of spun out of real estate in, in some respects because the, the banks, not just in Canada, but kind of globally, just continue to ratchet up uh, their lending criteria, make it harder and harder mm -hmm. for small and mid-sized yeah. businesses. I certainly know when I was growing this that when you want to go to the bank to get any kind of money, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, there's, there's a window here. They're continuing to clamp down. There's like a little, a small vacuum of opportunity. And so, you know, there, there again, just going back to our core strategy, little niche we thought we could move into that was a natural fit to our core business. And is that the that corporate lending, is that combined with real estate lending, it's similar to like how BDC would do mm -hmm. it or Roynat where you guys mm -hmm. offer on like an industrial owner's property, mm -hmm. uh, sort of 90% leverage or 85% or even higher just depending yeah. on uh, sort of the, the need? Yeah, so it is similar in, in, in many ways to what uh, a, a Roynat may, may do. I okay. mean, our, our goal in that business, so we that portfolio, which is our Centurion Financial Trust, the goal of that fund is just do private debt wherever we see the right opportunity. So we can do real estate, we can also do cor corporate. Okay. But the, the structure of the corporate uh, type investments, we thought one of the structures in the market that we noticed is most of the funds that do this take a very segmented approach. They're doing factoring, like accounts receivable mm -hmm. uh, factoring. Or they might be doing you know, real estate related debt for corporates. Or they might be doing royalties, or maybe they're doing just bridge or mez or long term. We thought there's not really a lot of platforms out there that will take a more holistic approach and just try to solve corporate problems, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what's your core problem? And then try to figure out how do we structure something that meets our risk metrics mm -hmm. and our return guidelines with what the client needs as opposed to, hey, we only do this one thing. And if, if we can't help you, sorry. So we just thought that was an interesting niche and that's kind of how we carved it out. Interesting. Um, how do you think about, so I, I've watched a lot of interviews yeah. of you in preparation for this, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you guys aren't too put off by recessions, uh, no. obviously it can be an opportunity yeah. in, in the real estate world, um, but with the diversification of your, you know, mm -hmm. having a uh, small and medium size, or, you know, investing in enterprises, yeah. um, being more on the lending side, mm -hmm. uh, how will the next recession affect you guys, and how are you kind of preparing sure. for that? That's a great question. Um, you know, certainly on the uh, the apartment side, we think the apartments are pretty well insulated. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the interest rate cycle probably having come to an end or very close to it before it turns when we go into the next recession, I mean, people have a, a core need to live somewhere. And we're continuing to bring in a lot of people into this country and not yeah. creating enough housing for them. Yeah. So we have got a, a severe housing crisis going on. We're seeing that. In, in the rent movements pretty much everywhere in the country with some, some exceptions in Western Canada. Um, so I'm not too worried about the apartment space. On the real estate debt side, um, certainly the focus of our real estate debt program has been the types of assets that we'd like to own. So multi-family type, type investments. So we think we've got the platform that, that will give us the ability to work those things out if and when they happen. And there's right. no doubt you go through right. tougher times. Yeah. But if you're building an apartment building where we think that there's core core demand and the developer runs into problems, like we've got, a, we've got an operating platform, so we'll just take that through to completion and finish it off, and, and it's a good long-term hold for us. I think it's a great fit. On, on the corporate side, I, th I think we're going certainly full, like wi wide open eyes into the market. And, and if you look at, hi at history, the best opportunities that you have or going into a recession. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll have some really great opportunities to make some good investments when you know the next recession gets hit. And we've got, we're sitting on a lot of dry powder right now waiting for that opportunity. I was just gonna ask that, are you guys sitting on capital? Just yeah, we've got a lot of capital waiting. Waiting, yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, no, it's something that obviously we, we've seen in our space that just apartments tend to be counter cyclical, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when the markets are going call it on a bit of a down curve yeah. and everyone still needs a place to live yeah. they typically don't trade at a discount no one's really going to sell their apartment building because you're still able to get the same rent yeah. and vacancy might go from like what one percent to 1.4 percent or 1.8 percent right well so vacancy rates are really <coughs> dropping nationally right i mean toronto is around one percent our our portfolio sits today at around 99 and a half percent occupancy mm -hmm. so you know very very difficult to actually to keep 
any product available because yeah. it gets snapped up so quickly. So, and that's that leads sort of to the next point that we were just going to touch base on, and that's sort of the restrictions that have been put on to the mm -hmm. supply or to the c prices of rent yeah. and sort of what you would see as someone that's in the space as a, as a leader in the yeah. space sort of for ways for there to be more supply or, or more housing. How, how do you counter that current climate of restricting housing in the multifamily space? So I've got lots of ideas on this. Um, <laughs> you know, the first, first thing was getting rid, rid of rent control. Yeah. Um, the problem was that they got rid of rent control after they just flip-flopped on this last year. So the development community, right. rightly so, has been very cynical of government that they could just flip the switch at any yeah. time and switch it off. And of course they did it. Mm -hmm. And you know, so flipping it back, the development community has just been reminded right in your face how pernicious governments can be. Yeah. So there's no guarantee that you're gonna build a 100 year asset and the government that comes in in four years doesn't change their mind again. Right. So, you know. That's what happened in 1990, right? That's right. Everybody points to that example and says, well, they took away rent control right there. Yep. It's like, not really. Yep. <laughs> flip-flop like three years before that and then. That's right. That's right. So it was uh, these, these flip-flops, which, you know, it's not like we're, when you build a condo, you have less of those concerns because you're in and out of the ground. You sell them and then yep. they change the rules, they sold it. So, right. so let's get back to the core question of how do you create more supply? So rent control is certainly one aspect. The, the other is, look, development charges, they just doubled in sure. Toronto. So this is the silliest thing ever. You want new development, make new development for multifamily, development, free, uh, d development charge free. Right. Give property tax waivers. Doesn't have to be forever, give for 10 years, right? No HST, no G GST, right? Like just get, yeah. ri get, rid, of the, get rid of the tax burden. Right. Then the next thing has to be we as a society and the cities have to get more comfortable with the idea of, you know, we need to build along the transit nodes where, where people need it. Yeah. And if you look, you drive anywhere in Toronto and you go, oh my God, you know, we could solve the housing problem almost immediately yeah. by just looking up and down, for example, Young Street or any of these yeah. corridor yeah. sites. Or and the say, downforce. Yeah, or the downforce and say, anything that's lower than three stories is open for development you have to suspend air rights for you know the people behind the, that's typically what we call nimbyism yeah um, you know and 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 realize that if we're going to bring in 350,000 people per year we have to we as a society have an obligation to give these people a chance to live somewhere yeah S so question for you on that so right in Vancouver they used to have like the rental 100 program yeah. and other programs to incentivize mm -hmm. developers mm -hmm. to build more multifamily uh, units, right, and whether it be quicker timelines yeah. to take it through the rezoning process yeah. or increase uh, density, decrease yeah. parking restrictions. Yeah. Uh, what do they have like that here in Toronto that they're currently using to help? Or is there anything like that right now? Well, I mean, uh, under Premier Wynne, she had introduced uh, development charge waivers. She set up this $100 million development charge subsidy or g give backs, which, you know, made good press. But for anyone who looks at, a, a, like that only covered a few few units. Mm -hmm. And it's not, wasn't enough, and it was really just a cynical design for, for the press and you know, a po population that doesn't understand how little $100 million uh, goes when yeah. you, know, you build an, a new building in Toronto, and you have 60,000 60, development charge per suite, build 500 units, and that's almost one third of it, <laughs> wow. right? So that's, that's it's crazy that, uh, you know, and then, then we look at si silly things, like we have a number of buildings in our portfolio where we can uh, convert them into units, like, you know, old storage rooms or attics or mm -hmm. things where we can make viable units. And the development charges are our largest expense. So we have, units that we could potentially make, but for years we weren't able to do because the development charges right. crushed it. Mm -hmm. So, but the cities are begging for supply. We're happy to create supply. Just why, you know, it's not gonna change the function of the building, but they just want their dip at the tax. Yeah, so revenue for them. It, but it's, wouldn't it's they revenue. get more revenue by allowing more supply to be built? I mean, that's just for me, I guess it's kind of almost counterintuitive, right? I mean, you're gonna build more and build quicker if you have right. more opportunities to that, do that. that right? That's right. 
I mean, there would be so many opportunities, to, I think, to build accretively in the city if they just made it possibly take away the development charges. You want to keep them there for condos, fine. That's, that's do, do that. Well, it's easier to finance condos, yeah. too. I mean, you're in the yeah. lending sector, right? Yeah. You get pre-sales, you can yep. use those deposit money and then insure it at pretty much zero, like one, one and a half Th or one percent, right. right? And with apartments, it's a lot of, it's sort of the reverse, right? You have to kind of show that you have the capacity to operate something, a, a lender. As, as a lender, you look at it in a, sort of a, well, a different spectrum. There's no clearly defined takeout, oftentimes. Th the, reality, the reality is, even in the removal of rent controls in Toronto is not going to change the supply aside from the you know development com community being rightly suspicious of government uh, volatility on, on regulation the issue is at 250 300 dollars per buildable foot it is impossible to buy a site in Toronto at those prices and make them work as a rental no right. so the only viable product to build is condo now that doesn't yep. solve the rental rental housing crisis, right? It helps you build, m maybe allows you to build condos, but not rental housing. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a way to, to fix that unless you have uh, area-specific zoning or maybe increased densification, or you say to a developer, oh, you want, you want to build 100 condos? Well, you got to build 30 rental suites, and we're going to give you 150 of density, right? So they're going to give right. extra density bonuses for building rental, and they're going to waive costs on those those kind of things. So there there are opportunities, but governments can't seem to get over themselves. So I've been on these um, these these panels before where you know governments come up and they ask you why aren't you building in, in our community? And I said, well <laughs> you know sure, you know, like <laughs> we we'd love to build apartments in this area. And I'm not gonna single anyone out by name, but we'd love to build apartments in this area. And uh, you know we think we can make it work, but we need a property tax waiver. We need development or charge uh, waivers, and that's yeah. how we can make the numbers work. Right. And like, oh well, we're not. We can't do that. Yeah. Like, well then you're not going to get apartments, right. right? And no one's going to do it. And, and people counter, oh yeah, guys are building apartments. And I would say, challenge yourself to look at the profile of who's building in, in Toronto new condos or new apartments and. They fit really one or two profiles. They're either in a very specific area of Toronto where you can earn six dollars a square foot on rent, yeah. right? It's a Yorkville like or something. Yorkville. <laughs> so you're going to build them there. <laughs> and the other areas where it makes sense is you've got a landowner who's owned it for 20 years. It's a pension fund, right. mm -hmm. and the way they look at it is, okay, we're going to build long-term revenue stream for our pension pensioners as opposed to maximizing the NPV, um, which is what any developer is going to do. They're going to, like, I don't want to build a product that's worth $600 when I could build a product that's worth $1,200. Right. I mean, you have to have your head examined to do yeah. that. Yeah. Especially with, you have investors, you have yep. uh, so many considerations to take in, right? That's I mean, right. They got to try to make it in a way that uh, your investors are able to profit from that's right. building whatever you're building, right? Exactly. So uh, so speaking of those sort of headwinds and, and tailwinds that you've seen in the past, what are some of the biggest headwinds and tailwinds, whether it be political or, or just market-specific that you're seeing right now here in Canada? I mean, the biggest headwinds we have are, are political. I mean, the biggest things I worry about that keep me up at night are political. I mean, we have a, uh, a federal government who seems intent on destroying half the country in, in Western Canada. We're not, we can't get yeah. pipelines built. We're taxing our investors too much. We're talking taxing our entrepreneurs too much. Yeah. We're vilifying our entrepreneurs, yeah. the people who want to create create jobs and opportunities, and you know, so capital's fleeing in real time. Uh, I mean, I mean, we even look at our own portfolio where we're not selling, but a good part of our focus is on U.S. opportunities. Mm -hmm. Right. You recently invested uh, a large chunk in the U.S. Yeah. as well, right? So we we have been. So we made our, our first property acquisition, but we're on about our seventh uh, equity investment. So we've yeah. got a number, we're following a very similar strategy to what we've done in Canada to build our, our pipeline, which is finance development. Yeah. But it, it's fascinating, you know, that the deals that we're doing today or that we've done this year will complete sooner than deals that we financed, uh. you know, years before in Canada and will complete years after. Mm -hmm. The development process in Canada is so long, but it's just amazing how quickly you can 
find an opportunity in the United States and put up new supply. Yeah. And it's, it's the development timeline, not the construction timeline, that's the major difference, correct? Like the, or is it well, a bit of both? It's, it's a bit of both. So okay. I mean, it's, it's the development and entitlement here yeah. just takes so long, yeah. uh, and so it adds risk. Um, the other thing is construction timelines are better because we don't have to contend if you're dealing with you know, in the southern United States. Yeah. You don't have to contend with the, the cold weather and, uh, and all, that okay. all that kind of stuff. So how does that make the development IRRs work? Well, if you think about lower overall material costs because of mm -hmm. weather, yeah. uh, think about development charges. I talk about development charges to US developers and they're like, what? what are those, right? <laughs> So there's a lower absolute cost. Um, like we're able to build brand new product in the United States yeah. cheaper than we can buy 50 year old product here. Yeah. So how does that make sense? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, let's just so you take out the development, you reduce the development costs, you shorten the development time, so your money is in and out from as from as a developer in a shorter period of time. So even though the gross margin might be exactly the same. You know, when you factor in the time and the cost of your money, IRRs in the United States are actually better than they are in Canada mm -hmm. for building brand new product. And we've heard a lot about that just from other, even call it institutional players, yeah. uh, some of the bigger players having mm -hmm. the capital leaving the country, and yeah. it seems to be a big trend. Like even CPPIB and yeah. all, all the big guys, but, but even on sort of the clients that we've dealt with on the private yeah. side, they're saying, well, right now, if they're looking at apartment buildings, it's hard to buy one in Toronto because there's yeah. only a few players that can yeah. really that'll pay market prices, yeah. um, but they're okay to look down in Phoenix or in yep. Florida Texas. or in Texas, yeah. exactly, yeah. where there's actually, I guess, less less sort of condensed competition yeah. there and there's more supply, so you That's can actually right. compete yeah. in those markets. Right. I think a lot of that stems from what you mentioned, the vilification of the landlord. Do you see that changing or you know, do you know where that comes from? Is there, are we gonna get out of that? Well, I mean, part of it is the use of the word landlord, right? I mean, we still use that, right. but it goes back <laughs> right. to like the Middle Ages, yeah. and uh, it gives very much a uh, you know us versus them. Whereas you know we're really a service provider, right? I, I you know we use the term landlord, but it's not a really great great term. Uh, today, look, I, I I think there it's a very difficult environment. Right. So we're in Toronto, we have. Like we, we talked about 1% vacancy, which in my definition is means zero, mm -hmm. right? Because there's always units off the market that you've got to paint or rent. Yeah, so you're you think about it, right? Yeah, so you think about availability. Availability is effectively zero. We literally get hundreds of people who call per apartment, Wow. okay, to, to get an opportunity to rent. So in that kind of environment, you know, people and rents are rising very quickly because there's not enough supply and we continue to let people in, which is fine. Like I'm, I'm pro immigration, but the issue is we're letting in so many people and then not m putting the systems in place to provide them opportunities for housing. Mm -hmm. So this is just creating this, uh, this situation, which is really quite untenable where um, there's not enough supply. So, you know, people are gonna start getting pretty angry. I think they're already angry and that's, yeah. that is starting to blow back against our industry. Okay, just to jump back, jump yeah. right back in. Uh, so, like today, it's a lot harder to find opportunity. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now, speaking specifically about apartments, yeah. um, if you were starting out again right now mm -hmm. in Toronto, where would you look for opportunities, or like, is it even possible to build a portfolio as a private uh, investor? Uh, I've I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I think if I was starting out from scratch today, would it be impossible? Um, mm. You know, one of the things that we had when we started our portfolio was cap rates were so high, the, the relative returns were so good that you had, uh, in building a portfolio, you had enough juice that you could cover your overheads to build an organization, to build a team, to build the systems. Right. And today, I think the only ones who can really make it work means you, you need an infrastructure, Yeah. right? Because the margins are now thin. Right, and you need when you're buying today at the cap rates, you need to execute with almost near perfection to hit your targeted returns. Whereas certainly when I started almost 16 years ago, um, you just there was just so much fat, so much cushion that right. you could make all kinds of mistakes. And you know I've always said that multifamily is one of the most, or if not the most, forgiving asset class mm -hmm. uh, in the real estate space, if not any asset. 
but today there's just so little margin for error that I think starting out would be next to impossible. Yeah, especially right now with the, I don't know, even if you're, it's really, <laughs> really gloom for us, but even if you have like yeah. a couple million bucks, right, if I'm trying to buy a, a, an yeah. apartment and yeah. it's something that you guys are looking at, I mean, if Dama, if you're in the brokerage side, who would you like more likely to be to sell it to? Someone that doesn't yeah, have a track record, yeah. Yeah, the closing can. sort of would be more questionable yeah. in that yeah. case, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we get like on the investment side, yeah. I get calls every day from guys saying, oh, you know, do you have any uh, great off-market deals? I was like, yeah, but like, you know, if you have like King said and yeah. Centurion coming yeah. in and saying, okay, well, do you have anything on the East End? I'm gonna go to Joe Blow over yeah. here who I don't know if he can close. I don't know if his capital store, That's right. you know? It's just, That's right. yeah, so I can imagine it's tough for those guys, but. Uh, it's, it's very tough and, and like I said, even if they were on market and competed and were able to buy it at the price that it would probably trade at, if you're small, you just don't have the economies to make that work. You probably don't have you know, the operating team, and today it's operations, right? Like, to give you an idea, you know, when I started in this business, NOI margins were like 45. Right. Mm -hmm. And today we're approaching 70, in our, certainly in our business. And, you know, a whole bunch of things went into that, but a very large portion of that is execution, right? Which you're having the operating teams to just make sure you just take everything out of the oper uh, of the property that you can your operating expenses the inefficiencies and these kind of things right. so you know I think um, if you were starting today and you just didn't have that fat and you had to pay the pr the, the market or the market price I just don't think you can get returns mm -hmm. and, um, sorry just one one more question yeah um, can you speak a little bit to the I don't think a lot of people have a good understanding of the REIT as a vehicle, as a mm -hmm. tax efficient vehicle mm -hmm. with, um, you know, uh, what is it, Co capital cost allowance yeah. and, the, you know, that depreciation that allows yeah. for a more strategic investment. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of describe that a little bit and why sure. it has an advantage? Okay, so after they got rid of the income tax. Trust uh, rules. So that was when mm -hmm. companies were converting to income trusts, so that there was Utilities no tax at the corporate anything, level. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that w the companies would distribute uh, the income, and then they'd be taxed once in in investors' hands. The governments right. didn't like that because they want to tax it as many times as they can. Right. So the REITs were really what was left over. So what makes a REIT tax efficient? Well, when you own a, an apartment building, we're allowed to depreciate the assets, right? So if 80% of an apartment building is call it roofs and windows and boilers and parking lots and these kind of things. You get to depreciate that and deduct the, that cost, uh, we call it capital cost allowance or CCA, mm -hmm. and deduct that against the income that comes in. And that means for a lot of the REITs, you know, between 60 and 80% uh, is kind of the range, maybe, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. Uh, is what they call return of capital. So it's not taxable in the area that you, you receive it. So it ma right. makes REIT, REITs very tax efficient. And in terms of a public REIT versus a private REIT mm -hmm. and, and sort of what the advantages are of, of being a public REIT versus yeah. a private REIT, obviously there's a liquidity factor that you have to take into consideration when you have a public REIT vehicle, but uh, I'm assuming there's a bit of a liquidity premium that you get as an investor for investing into a, a private REIT. Is that typically the case? I, th I think that there there is a bit of a liquidity premium. Um, you know, I think we've we've done a lot of investor education about, you know, do, do you really need liquidity as much as everyone focuses on liquidity? Mm -hmm. And to the extent that you do, then have a portion of your portfolio that is for that. You have mm -hmm. some deposits, you have some money market funds, you have you know, some short-term bonds or whatever, and that's the part of your portfolio that you keep for that. But you should look at, at, at things like real estate as long-term holds. I mean, that's the most money in real estate is made from holding it for the, for the very long term. And we see as a result, very, very low rates of unit holder turnover between two and a half and three and a half percent per year. Mm. So yeah, there, there's the liquidity that comes with being public. The downside of that is when you fall slightly out of favor off your prices crater. And that just for someone who's a long-term investor, 
you know, it just messes with your psyche when you see your portfolio value cut down 20% and you're like, oh my God, and you're worried about, can I make my mortgage payment in my retirement, mm -hmm. right? So you worry about those things. And I think uh, being private, as long as you got a responsible manager who's not doing silly things, um, allows you to kind of not worry about that. Your statement volatility mirrors much more similarly because we're priced on the value of the underlying assets. So you, what we're trying to do is to replicate the experience as if you'd owned a piece of that building and the right. volatility mm -hmm. or lack of volatility that you'd see in the underlying asset, not what you see from being a public company. Yeah, I mean, if, if something happens in the news, like let's say Trump does something yeah. and all reads suddenly take a hit, I mean, yeah. you in the private side, I'm assuming, don't take that hit because there's no, no way to measure that, no. right? So, and, and the tenants are still paying rents in those buildings, pay, right? Tenants still pay rents. In fact, we, we've noticed that every time there seems to be a, a, a market decline that we seem to get uh, an influx of capital. Okay. Right? So that's that's tended to be good news for us. Yeah. Um, you know, so very excited. Yeah. Well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, te it, it does tend to be, uh, we tend to see a little bit of that anti-correlation going on, which right. I think is, which is think is good. And so with your three different funds too, what are the yeah. typical kind of call it returns that investors can can sort of look for. Uh, yeah. First of all, I'd like to get into that and yeah. understand sort of what your investment analysis decision is like on the sort of the three different uh, sort of buckets. Sure. Um, so generally speaking, we, we say, look, we target between seven and 12. Um, you know, our REIT uh, going back to 2006, so the extended track record is just short of 16% annual compounded uh, rate of return. Okay. Um, from 2009, when we officially launched as a REIT, uh, it's, it's averaged around 12, a little over 12, no losing quarters. The last two years, about 18% returns per, per year on 30% wow. leverage. So it's only 30%? Yes. Wow, okay. Yeah, That's so really, really strong, it, strong. It, it, strong. <laughs> yeah. And is that leverage done through like CMHC? Prim from primarily, primarily most okay. of our leverage comes uh, from CMHC, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then on the other two funds, I guess uh, if you could sort of let us know how they sure uh, we target the same kind of returns. Are are they've they both are averaging around twelve, so all of our funds coincidentally are not too far apart from twelve. But we do say, you know, seven to twelve was kind of the target. We tried to out outperform that obviously, but I like to give people confidence of being in a range and to the extent that we can outperform it. Well, that's great. Yeah. One, so another question to your private experience yeah. before, um, or kind of investment analysis experience. When there's blood in the streets yeah. for the, s the smaller investor, yeah. what sort of opportunities should they look for? So when there's blood in the streets, and I'm not convinced there's going to be blood in the streets this time, I think it's okay. the, the biggest problem for the smallest investor is, is psychology, right? right? Um, that when there's blood in the street, they just, you know, everyone says, oh, when there's blood in the streets, I'm going to be there. But and but they rarely are, rare, very rarely are, because they've got leverage on their own house or other properties or their business, and, you know, their banks are calling. So you really have to be well prepared and, and, uh, and, and be ready to jump in. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure where the... In the, on the real estate side, that there's there's a lot of room in today's market uh, for small investors. Like I said, it, right. the the market, if anything, in the last decade has just focused on continual consolidation. And if you look at the bigger players, I mean, bigger players tend to be having bigger margins, and that's what's allowing them to to ha have uh, a lower cost of capital and thus be successful. I, I mean, I, I read a really good research analyst paper once and said, look, the, the key to success in being uh, a REIT or a real estate investor is lowest cost of capital wins. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a certain amount of, yeah. of, well, of pension truth in capital, that. right? I mean, think about how successful they've been. And yes. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right? So. And they've got capital. They can ride out long periods of time. And, you know, when you don't have to pay immediate distributions yeah. to to unit holders, or you don't have to pay attention to the stock market appraisal of how well you're doing, then you get a, you know, and you got a 50 year horizon, well, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Well, and I guess that's why companies like say Centurion or other funds have been quite successful the past few years, is that a lot of private investors that maybe would have wanted to own it directly yeah. are now 
deciding to go through that indirect yeah. route, yeah. Uh, going through a fund or through a REIT or whatever the vehicle right. may be. I, I, th I think that's true. I mean, we do see investors who come through and say, you know, why don't I do this myself? I don't get this question very often anymore, but I, I used to get it a lot. They say, why don't I do this on, on my own? And we would tell them, look, apartments aren't really sophisticated. Right. That, you know, you can buy them, you collect the rents, you pay the, pay the utilities. Mm -hmm. To do them well is a very sophisticated business. And if you don't know how to do that, and you have a day job, yeah, right? I would almost guarantee that we could extract, or most professionals in our space, not just us, would be able to extract superior rates of return, even factoring in, okay, you have to pay for managers, and you have to pay for you know, bonuses for staff, and all of these things. We'd still provide higher returns on an absolute basis, not to mention more diversified, so better risk-adjusted mm -hmm. terms, yeah. than you'd be able to, to do on your own. And by the way, you don't get paid on your own when you're having to fix toilets on a weekend. Right, right. <laughs> God. Anyways, Greg, thanks for coming on the show My and we pleasure. appreciate uh, you sharing your insights. We'll have information for Centurion and yeah. so anyone that's more interested in the company or yourself can check out the uh, site below. And yeah, thanks for having us. My pleasure, thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye.